then. Um, good morning. So today is the third and final installment of um, different types of, of theoretical questions, theory problems, and this one is a is a is a real corker. This one is the question of ideology. Um, which you will have encountered before, you will have encountered different theories of ideology. Um, so I will link it to uh, theories of ideology that you have probably met before. And this is the blurb from the handbook. Um, the modern Western interest in ancient Eastern philosophies, religions, practices and worldviews raises lots of questions, some of which we've already looked at about cultural translation, cultural appropriation or expropriation, questions of interpretation and authenticity and so on. This week we confront some of these head-on via the time-honoured Marxian or Marxist questions of ideology. So it's normally an accusation, that's ideological. Marxists think that they, they can see the truth, um, they can see through all the bullshit and they know the truth. A lot of people, a lot of people think that, um, but but ideology twists you around if, once you start to accept the idea of what I, okay, of what ideology is. So, the question is: Are contemporary Western interests in ostensibly ancient Eastern philosophies, religions, practices, and worldviews ideological? So this week we explore the proposition by looking at its theorization in the work of Slavoj Žižek as well as in a range of related studies of the westernization of Eastern ideas, outlooks and practices, including spirituality, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, feng shui, Taoism and Buddhism, stuff like that. Um, so the structure of the lecture is you talk about the, the appeal of Eastern wisdom, Eastern philosophy, for um, Westerners. That's the first kind of structure. Hello. And then we will um, think about the modern world and, and, and its relationship to supposedly Eastern spirituality. We'll spend a fair bit of time on Zizek, on Zizek's sort of, Mar sort of Marxist critique. Uh, and then we'll have a mindfulness break. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to have a mindfulness break and that's going to help us all. It's going to be great, okay? Then we're going to talk a little bit more about Zizek and how to understand Zizek. And then I'm going to go through the major sorts of theoretical arguments of um, some related perspectives, some of the texts that are on the primary and secondary reading for this week and other weeks. Okay? If there's time, um, I might show you some clips from um, The Matrix. There's always a reason to show clips from the Matrix. And um, at the end, I've got some slides to remind you that it's the NSS or something, the National Student Survey, and you should log in and say how fab everything is. Or whatever, say whatever. Um, so I'll put those slides up. So, first question. What kind of things is it, are they, that Westerners are interested in when they are interested in Eastern philosophy and they're interested in stuff that nowadays makes its way onto memes quite a lot. Little aphorisms, Eastern wisdom, West Eastern outlooks um, that you can ponder, that you can philosophize about. A lot of them are from people like Lao Tzu, or from uh, Lao Tzu, or rather, um, or Buddha. Buddha's a biggie. Um, Gandhi is a biggie. And all the rest, like loads and loads of names. Not so much Confucius, but sometimes Confucius normally uh, Lao Tzu. So, this is my favourite. He who knows does not speak, he who speaks does not know. So I don't know whether to shut up or... Uh, I'll continue, all right? Um, other ones, so this one over here by Chuang Tzu. Uh, flow with whatever may happen and let your mind be free. Stay centered, accepting whatever you will. All this kind of stuff. A lot of it's shit, a lot of it's fake, a lot of it's made up. 
It's like, you know, I often get people sending me Bruce Lee quotes like this, and I like, Bruce Lee never said anything of the sort. Gandhi never said that, right? You know, Buddha never said that. But there's a lot of cool stuff, cool sounding stuff. That's all very like that. It's often very therapeutic. Um, uh, I can joke about it, but you know, I've been sincerely interested in these things at different ways, different times. And I, I think about this a lot. I remember when, so my dad died um, like in 2003. And I remember, it's like it's really sad when someone dies, really, really messes you up. And I spent a lot of time reading um, Chinese philosophy. Because it, it, it sort of helped. Because it's, it's all about like not clinging. It's all about not, it, it's just, you, your sadness and your grief is, is a response to your clinging to something that was always going to go. And it genuinely helped me. Um, so, we can joke, but it has a therapeutic status in people's lives. It's not just people showing off, it's not just bullshit, it's not just, uh, it, it has a lot of um, psychological, emotional and, 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 and intellectual even uses. Um, Sometimes it's abused, it's picked up, it sounds cool, it's, it, it's used to market things. Um, but other times it, it's, it's interesting and it's valuable, okay? So it's this kind of... And there's a, there's a narrative that we'll go back to again, there's a historical narrative in which the sort of the Western world in the 20th century often looked elsewhere for different philosophical principles. Uh, people were became tired with, tired of Christianity, Judaism, um, Islam, and, and 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 Western rationality, and therefore you turn east, or you turn to the mystical, you turn to the non-rational, the non-logocentric. We'll talk about that over the over the coming weeks. Um, and the question is is why we've looked at binaries a lot recently, and there are different ways, and there's different ways of constructing binaries. Now, Ray Chow, who, who is, uh, makes her way onto the reading list, we, we looked at some Ray Chow last week, and she's in secondary reading quite a lot in this module. She um, proposed the idea of primitive passions as well, which is another way of thinking about um, what happens when we live in a, a busy, modern, dense, urban, media-saturated, chaotic, technologically organized world, what happens? And she proposes that in times of these great change where we feel kind of maybe rootless, we feel like the world is whizzing along faster, we start to long for the past, not our actual past, not our childhood, but like a mythical past, and she calls this primitive passions. And you can, you can find this as a kind of symptom arising in lots of different contexts. So, it's this fantasy of the, the peaceful, the closer to nature, the more natural, the more organic, and therefore somehow the more authentic and the more true. Ray Chow looks at all of this and calls it, uh, she thinks of it in terms of primitive passion. So that's one way that you can think about it. Um, and this connects us back to the the the, um, the Chris um, go to Joe and stuff that I skipped over in a lecture a couple of weeks ago. I said I'll get back to this. Um, he theorizes it in the same similar kind of way, but he talks about virtual orientalism and virtual spirituality and orientalist spirituality. Here's a quote from him. He says the idea that Zen or other traditions of spiritual philosophy from Japan can help us to overcome the dilemmas of modernity including nihilism, is a central theme in modern Japanese philosophy. So this would be a case of uh, maybe primitive passions where uh, even modern Japanese philosophy looks back to ancient Japanese philosophy and goes, you know, I think they were onto something. And at Zen, if you don't know anything about Zen, uh, or in Chinese, Chan, Buddhism, it's the ultimate kind of release. So like, if Taoism is about going with the flow, and it, it's actualized in principles such as not meeting force with force, but kind of going round, letting that kind of flow past or, or whatever. 
Um, these kind of principles, so you don't be forced with force. If something comes in hard, you go soft and, and so on. So on. Yin yang, right? Zen is, is the ultimate disengagement, disengagement from desire, disengagement from thought, disengagement from striving, and it's based in, in types of meditation. And so you, it, you don't have to think too hard to see how, you know, if you live in this crazy life, you, it's interesting that when this picture, um, without this, this graphic in it, without this intervention, it was clearly... This, this girl here, this woman, is, is like going, oh, she's stressed to high heaven. She's just, there's too much shit going on, information overload, she's too busy. But now that this, this design is cut into it, it's unclear whether she's actually just taking some time to chill out and have a mindfulness moment and go, or whether she's like at the end of a tether. And maybe they, these things are too, like, connected. You're at the end of your tether and you chill, right? Um, so, Zen presents itself as, a, as a, a viable way of coping, coping mechanism for modern life. Um, but what um, Chris Gotu Jones is interested in is this idea of what if there's, there's no escape from it? What if there's no escape from the digital world? And he, he talks about this kind of digital or techno kind of spirituality, which, is, which you see in so many ways in the 2000 film uh, the Matrix, the first one. So this is Neo at the end. It's only a couple of... Uh, it's not a long one. So he's been shot. He's dying. In the real world, Trinity's trying to wake him up. In the Matrix, he's dead which means in the real world you'll be dead also. So, and it goes on. Most of you know this, right? So, so this is this is kind of illustrates Chris Havel's great. Uh, no, Chris Havel's great. That's somebody else. Um, Chris Gotti Jones's um, argument about cyber spirituality, the kind of the idea. So, in the Matrix, Neo is the one because in the virtual world, Neo can um, control the logic of that universe. So, Go To Jones talks about this merging of the idea of the ancient spiritual with the new kind of cyber reality, the online world, the techno mediated reality. And he argues that a lot of cyberpunk sci fi picks up these themes, so you get this merging of the idea of the ancient or the universe, the one, the, 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 the everything, the matrix, um, with. Um, the human, the soul, and it comes out as a kind of cyberpunk spirituality. So this is one iteration, this is one version of this, the status of, of, of spirituality in um, um, the kind of postmodern world. So Chris, um, Chris Gotti-Jones talks about digital Asia <coughs> resembling a recovery of a pre-digital orientalism in which Asia represents the lost spirituality of the modern West. Ironically, the, this digital Asia emerged as a kind of retro-orientalism. So you've got this retro and this future. It's a fascination of a kind of, um, kind of Buddhist universality, uh, which is an unfair thing to say, actually, um, in, in technological form. So... And if you remember, um, Chris Gotti Jones does a lot of things. He kind of shows, in his text, he kind of shows the way in which the status of Asia in the digital, me in digital media, in science fiction, um, um, 
imaginaries and in, in computer games, it kind of keeps flipping into a, a diff, into a, an Orientalist form. So where you get the idea of Asia and Asians are somehow less and other than and different to like the true human. So it's, it's kind of, so here he talks about, uh, this is worth reading actually. The idea that the digital realm is culturally null, but that certain kinds of East Asian spiritual practices can overcome this emptiness um, is increasingly conventional. It feeds upon the established representations of a minimalist and starkly austere Zen aesthetic. <coughs> And it relies on the idea that Zen training is a process of eradicating emotion as a means to human betterment, even enlightenment, while the digital world is represented as simply deleting the space of emotional content altogether. To some extent, popular images of Zen in the West have always tended towards nihilism, but after the digital turn, this association begins to seem like a way to overcome apparent nihilism of the digital realm. So lots of things are possible here. Lots of ways of interpreting this. Either the, the, the idea of the Zen meditating Asian you know, Zen master as less than human because they've got rid of all that crap. They've got rid of all that baggage. And this flips into different sorts of images like the image, the image of the kamikaze, the image of the samurai. Now, okay, I might say more about this in coming weeks, but... Um, you remember the massacre in Iceland? Uh, Anders Breivik something, somebody Breivik, something like that, he was called. That guy prepared himself for massacring people on an island and setting off bombs uh, in Iceland by Zen meditation and picturing himself, picturing, picturing himself as a kind of Buddha, as a kind of samurai warrior. Now that's pretty messed up, right? But there's, there, this is entirely a, a plausible and possible kind of dovetailing of different themes here. We, we think of, of kind of Zen as, as peace and as calm, but it can also be an emptying out, maybe, and then you can flip it up. We'll get back to this, we'll talk about it in seminars. Um, and also in the future week, I've got a nice little article that I can talk through um, about this. But I wanted to get, to, I need to get to Slavoj Žižek's critique, which is complicated. And then we need our mindfulness break, and then we need to look at some, some other stuff, okay? So Slavoj Žižek, right? Marxist is what he says. I am a Marxist. I'll say more about what that means. But some of you will know he also uses Jacques Lacan psychoanalysis, so he's a very psychoanalytic theorist, and he's deeply into Hegel. Now, Hegel was a philosopher who influenced Marx and has influenced lots of people in different ways. So he, he, these are his three main things. In this argument, it's all Marxism. It's all his take on Marxism. So these are all quotations from the primary reading that I set. Uh, we're going to work through them. And at the end of it, we will need our mindfulness break. Okay. So Zizek says... The ultimate postmodern irony of today is the strange exchange between Europe and Asia. At the very moment when European technology and capitalism are triumphing worldwide at the level of the economic infrastructure, the Judeo-Christian legacy is threatened at the level of ideological superstructure in the European space itself by New Age Asiatic thought, which, in its different guises, ranging from Western Buddhism to different Taos, or Daos, is establishing itself as the hegemonic ideology of global capitalism. So, what does that mean? Postmodern world, an exchange between Asia and Europe. This is like, remember Heidegger last week? European technology, says Heidegger. Europeanization of the world, but then what? As we all get capitalist and we all get tech, technologically um, mediated in our lives, the ideology becomes Asian. What does that mean? What kind of Asian? At the end, he says he means Western Buddhism and Taoism. Um, these styles of thought, and so he's saying the economic base is kind of the the, the, the capitalist. Um, infrastructure and the ideological atmosphere of that 
is a kind of, he calls it Western Buddhism. And he puts it in inverted commas. Zizek makes a distinction between Buddhism and Western Buddhism, uh, and probably also Taoism and Western Taoism. Um, because he's talking about something that comes into existence in the life of, say, what he used to write about in terms of yuppies. So in the 1980s and through the 90s, there was a concept of the yuppie. And the yuppie was some like young, it was started to stand for something like young, upwardly mobile, professional person. And we're talking about stockbrokers, bankers, people who live in the city, people who just snorting cocaine and, and, and you know, not giving a shit about, not getting married and not having a pet dog, which is always a bit weird. And, you know, these kind of people, their ideology, the bad people, right? Hedge fund managers, evil capitalists, tax avoiders, we would call them now. These bad people. <laughs> that's what that's what Zizek does. So Zizek's a Marxist. Doesn't like these people. Stock market, speculation, stocks and shares, interest rates, exchange rates. Oh, buy some of this and sell some of that. Sell dollars, buy yen. No, do something else. <laughs> um, these people, bad people. This is their ideology, he says. And he calls it an ideological supplement. I put supplement in inverted commas there. Therein re resides the highest speculative identity of opposites in today's global civilization. Although Western Buddhism presents itself as the remedy against the stressful tension of capitalist dynamics, allowing us to uncouple and retain inner peace and gelassenheit, it actually functions as its perfect ideological supplement. German speakers, I've looked this word up in the past. I was going to look it up today. Can't remember. Gelassenheit. Anyone? Anyone got Google? Anyone online? Gelassenheit. <laughs> das macht nicht. It doesn't matter. Inner peace and something nice, right? Mean serenity. Serenity. Perfect. Um, so the speculative identity of opposites. Buddhism as a Buddhist ideology as a way to uncouple from the chaos and shit of everyday life and retain inner peace and serenity. And he says in that way it functions as its perfect ideological supplement. So it's something that it might appear different. You might feel like you're doing something countercultural. You might feel that you're escaping from um, the Western world, the world of money, finance, business, work, job, career, worry, anxiety, stress, pension, pension fund, it's gone, oh my god. Um, it's actually what you need to make you continue participating in that game. Um, a supplement. So, I, so the word supplement is something, in this sense, in this philosophical sense, it's something that might appear very different, but actually sustains. Like it's a kind of oil that, that, that lubricates the system. Um, everything needs its, its supplement. You know, you can't... You know when I see these absolutely demented things online, like do 100 press-ups every day for a month or something? I'm like, you just get tendonitis, man. You have to have rest days. The rest is a precondition for your ability to perform athletically. The rest isn't doing nothing. The rest is, although it's the opposite of exercise, you, you can't exercise without rest, right? That's a supplement. It looks like the opposite. It looks like you're not competing athletically, but it's, it's, it, but it's necessary to sustain that. So, um, the reason why um, Taoism or Buddhism is so popular. This, Zizek's writing this in about 2000-ish. This His book On Belief was published in 2001, and it's where he, he, he formulates this most kind of comprehensively. The thing with Zizek is he talks about stuff again and again and again and again and again, and he'll just copy and paste huge passages from one book into another book, which is a bit cynical, but that's what he does. Because he says, I want to argue the same thing again, so I'll just copy and paste. He's still doing talks on this. If you Google his lectures on this subject, he was still making these arguments in uh, 2012. 
I think the version of this that I've set for you to read comes slightly later than that even, it's after 2012, can't remember. Um, but what's interesting is that the first time he, he, he started to write this sort of stuff and said, this ideology is the dominant ideology of capitalism. If you do a search, like use LexisNexis or whatever, and you search newspaper and, or magazine stories, there is an increase in stories in British newspapers and magazines about things like yoga and Tai Chi and, and Buddhism and Taoism. Kind of got a point that around the turn of the century, this stuff was very fashionable. It was very popular in different ways. Also, we're seeing the Matrix and we're seeing all these other sorts of things emerging. But he says that we live in this capitalist world. It's, it's chaotic. There are so many possible beliefs. Very classic postmodern stuff. We don't know what truth is anymore. Fake news, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin saying one thing and other people saying another thing. So one more and more lacks the most elementary cognitive mapping, like the world is just chaos. We, we experience the world as chaos. The recourse to Taoism or Buddhism offers a way out of this predicament. And it's one that definitely works better than the desperate escape into old traditions. So Zizek argues that things like, it's not just Taoism and Buddhism which might seem like pretty kind of Californian surfer sort of chill out, go with the flow type ideologies. Also he argues that the popularity of fundamentalisms, that's any, any of the big fundamentalism, Islamic, Christian, I don't know much about, about Jewish, there, there are Jewish fundamentalisms, right? These are also reactions to the same chaos of the modern world. These are ways of going back and fighting for a simpler time, where there was good and there was bad and there was right and there was wrong. But Zizek argues that these kind of, um, say, fundamentalist Christian or fundamentalist whatever religions, they're not ideal ideologies for the modern world because they're not necessarily consumerist, they're not really serving the economy. And also they've got quite strong moral coordinates, very definite yeses and noes. Concepts like sin, for example, you know, and lists of what sins actually are. They're not the ideal ideological kind of belief system to have in a world where things are constantly being reinvented and new things to do and new things to consume and new things to believe and new things to get into. So. If it's a choice between like coping with it, he argues that the flow, if I go with the flow, I'll get a new phone, yeah, this phone's obsolete, I'll get a new phone. All my, all my education and training is now obsolete because it's a new platform and a new computer system. Oh, I'll go with the flow, I'll retrain. I'll not just go, I believe in religious fundament, I believe in this and that's that and I'm not doing that. Okay. So, ideologically he argues that it, that the, the flowing, the the, the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, relativist, also the relativism of these philosophies enables them to work quite well within capitalist contexts. Um, so, this is more Zizek. Instead of, instead of trying to cope with the accelerating rhythm of technological progress and social changes, one should rather renounce the very endeavour to retain control over what goes on, rejecting it as the expression of the modern logic of domination. One should instead let oneself go, drift along, while retaining an inner distance and indifference towards the mad dance of accelerated process, a distance based on the insight that all this social and technological upheaval is ultimately just a non-substantial proliferation of semblances that do not really concern the innermost kernel of our being. So, for Zizek, these philosophies and the practices associated with them in the modern capitalist consumerist world are almost the moments where we take the needle off the record or we just take the phone off the hook or put it on silent and go, right, this is my true self, this is my true me. This is the, the time of, of, of calming and finding and centering. And that this for Zizek is, I mean, is he judging this as a problem? He does judge this as a problem. 
to the extent that it supports our continued activity in um, practices like you know the whole banking, um, st stock exchange, buying and selling, um, destroying economies by speculating on different currencies and all that stuff. Um, if it enables us to do that, if it enables us to be like um, Anders, I think he's called Anders Bering Breivik, the guy who kind of took his, something like that, took his, his moral compass off and said, I'm just going to do this thing that I believe I have to do. So in, in, that, you, in, in that case, you have a fundamentalist who's also using these kind of meditative practices in a strange kind of hybrid belief system. Hybrid belief systems um, come back in different ways all the time. Um, so here, this is where we get to uh, Marxism. Oops. Really Marxism here. One is almost tempted to resuscitate the old infamous Marxist cliché of religion as the opium of the people, as the imaginary supplement to terrestrial misery. The Western Buddhist meditative stance is arguably the most efficient way for us to fully participate in capitalist dynamics while retaining the appearance of mental sanity. <coughs> if Max Weber were alive today, he would definitely write a second supplementary volume to his Protestant ethic, entitled The Taoist Ethic and the Spirit of Global Capitalism. So, um, Max Weber argued that Protestantism was a kind of um, inevitable grow outgrowth of, of capitalism, and it was the ideal ideology of capitalism. Because, in its simplest sense, industrial stage capitalism requires the vast majority of people to be working on very low wages, doing incredibly shit jobs, like inconceivably shit jobs, like going down mines, which people still do, admittedly, but like lots of people, right? In the age where everything is fired by coal, and everyone's going down things, or they're shipbuilding, or they're whatever, that's most people doing ultra shit jobs for very little money. And you need an ideology to get you through that. So Weber argued that things like um, booze, alcohol, drinking, beer, beer in uh, Britain, Germany, wine in France, because you come out, you get washed and you go, oh, and you get pissed. And, and you know, we, a lot of us, some of us sometimes still do that kind of thing. Like, oh, it's Friday, thank God. Boom, right? Yay. But also you need a belief system that this all makes sense for some reason. So Christianity and the Protestant type of Christianity is one where you just work hard, know your place, don't ask for too much, be frugal, be modest, be all of these things, have a good work ethic, because you'll get your happy ever after in heaven. Oh, look, up heaven, on a cloud, right? Next to a nice man with a beard, giving you ice creams and beer. Okay? Pew. That's the kind of logic. So beer, religion, wine, these are all ideological things. That's all, because ideology is material practices, it's not just belief system. So he argues that, and he brings, this is where he brings in, so that's where he was Marxist, this is where he's bringing in some of his psychoanalysis. Western Buddhism is a fetish. It enables you to fu fully participate in the frantic pace of the capitalist game while sustaining the perception that you are not really in it, that you are well aware um, of how worthless this spectacle is, and that what really matters to you is the peace of the inner self to which you know you can always withdraw. Um, so when he, his notion of the fetish is the idea of something that you need, um, and you either need it because you cling to it, you cling to the fetish. So he has different theories of fetish. There's the fetish that you, you don't know is your fetish, and then you have the fetish that you'd absolutely cling to because... So fetish comes from, it comes from Freud, comes from sex, right? It's literally in Freud it's about sexual stuff. Stuff that you need to have before you can get off. Either get sexually aroused or reach orgasm. That's your fetish, right? For Zizek, it's something that you just need. You just need it. So he gives the example of a character in um, uh, in fiction who 
who their partner dies or someone dies, but the dog survives, and so they don't fully grieve because they've got a dog, and that's always that's 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 them. That's part. And then when the dog dies, that's when you truly grieve, um, because now they've really gone. This other object is gone, or you, you've lost something of theirs. Um, it's quite bizarre, actually. There's lots to think about there. I'm sorry, I was de derailed in my thought processes because. So when my dad died, and I didn't expect I'd be talking about death today. So when my dad died, I was kind of okay. Like I kept going to work, I kept lecturing, I kept teaching, I kept everything, everything, everything. I think I missed one day because I had to go to the funeral. But then a year later, my grandma died. His mother. That's when I was screwed. Because then he was absolutely gone. There was not anyone who could even... And that's when I felt... I didn't fall to pieces because she died. Because she was, you know, distant figure, you know, like... You know, yes, yeah, sad, but that, that was, it was ca catastrophic for me. And the interesting thing was that my boss, who'd been very sympathetic until that time, kind of told me off. I was like, yeah, but psychoanalytically speaking, <laughs> this is my true grief now. But that's a digression. I'm sorry, I just thought I'd explain why I'd been a bit derailed, but because it, so does that mean my grandma was my fetish? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh, here we go. So, the fetish can... So, with Zizek, it's great with Zizek, because he wins either way. Either way, he wins. The fetish can function in two opposite ways. Either its role remains unconscious. So this is his example. As in the case of Shoot's heroine, who was unaware of the fetish role of the dog. Or, you think that the fetish is what is that which really matters. As in the case of a Western Buddhist, unaware that the truth of his existence is in fact the social involvement which he tends to dismiss as a mere game. So Zizek has, Zizek's picture is of a meditating yuppie. That, that he often, he's written about this, like that's his example. The meditating yuppie who works in the city um, and they work in finance, capitalism and they think that their true life is when they're meditating in their cool pad on their yoga mat or whatever. But they, they think that the capitalist stuff, the work stuff, is a game, but what, that's an inversion of the truth. The reality is, from a Marxist perspective, your truth, your reality, is you as an economic unit, like in the Matrix, you as a battery to the, to the system. So this is a, 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 long, a long section. I think we're reaching the end of Zizek now. Yeah. Which is good, where I have a sketch. schedule. 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 Um, so... That's quite small text, but I'll read it to you because um, I like this section. This one isn't in the reading that I set you as the primary reading. This is from Unbelief. This is the, like the first time that he wrote this stuff. <coughs> this is the very nerve center of liberal ideology. Freedom of choice. Remember freedom of choice? That's ideology. That is liberalism. That is where individual units we have. Where, where rational economic units... That's like liberal, kind of political. Homo economicus, economic man, rational choice. We're all free to choose whatever we want. Yay, freedom. So, freedom of choice. Grounded in the notion of the psychological subject endowed with propensities he or she strives to realise. Like, we all think that we're individual. You know, we all think we're individuals. We all think we have choices. We all think we have potentials, because we talk about, oh, yeah, I'm, good at, I'm not very good at maths, but I'm good at this, and I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at running, but I'm good at jumping, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm good at swimming, so therefore... Um, we think we have these potentials within us. This is a psychological model of us, and it's not wrong. It's just a way of thinking about the world that might not be quite the way a Marxist would think about the world. This especially holds today in the era of what sociologists like Ulrich Beck called risk society, when the ruling ideology endeavours to sell us the insecurity caused by the dismantling of the welfare state as an opportunity for new freedoms. So, once upon a time, in the past, in Britain, you had a strong welfare state, so you would go to school, go, maybe go to university maybe, and you'd get a job and you'd pay into a pension, and if you lost your job you'd get, you'd get income, uh, you'd get unemployment benefits, income support, things like that. 
You'd reach 60, 65, you'd retire, you'd get a pension, you could live on it. Everything was stable because it was underpinned by things like the gold standard in, in, in world economics and the state would underpin pensions and things like that. And then they privatised them all, sold them, so that your pension may go up or down in value, right? And, you, and your pension itself becomes you know, something that may not exist by the time you retire and the value of it may not be meaningful in any way. So this is risk society where these things are sold and we speculate and we invest. And then the ruling ideology endeavours to sell us the insecurity caused by the dismantling of the welfare state as the opportunity for new freedoms. There's no such thing, it's not just the state pension anymore. You could invest in your own pension or a different pension or you could just play Monopoly or you could, you know, whatever, right? You could do whatever you want. Yay, freedom. Um, you have to change jobs every year, relying on short-term contract instead of a long-term stable appointment. Why not see it as the liberation from the constraints of a fixed job, as the chance to reinvent yourself again and again, to become aware of and realise hidden potentials of your personality? You can no longer rely on the standard health insurance and retirement plan, so that you have to opt for additional coverage for which you have to pay. Why not perceive it as an additional opportunity to choose either better life now or long-term security? And if this predicament causes you anxiety, the postmodern or second modernity ideologist will immediately accuse you of being unable to assume full freedom, of the escape from freedom, of the immature sticking to old stable forms. Even better, when this is inscribed into the ideology of the subject as the psychological individual pregnant with natural abilities and tendencies, then I, as it were, automatically interpret all these changes as the results of my personality, not as the result of me being thrown around by market forces. So, there's your clue there. We are thrown around by market forces. In the past, big, stable institutions such as nation-states would have their own banks, they would have their own investment, they'd have gold reserves, they'd have all these things. And populations would be secure and stable. Now it's all been deregulated since Thatcher and Reagan and the neoliberalism of the 70s and 80s. And you can no longer rely on anything. But the ideology tells us it's an ideology of freedom, it's an ideology of you. You, the entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship of the self. Like I grew up growing through these, this shit, these battles, and you had like Margaret Thatcher literally telling us that if you were an adult, if you were 18 years old, or I think she said, I think she said 30 years old actually, if you're 30 years old and you still take the bus, then you're a failure. You should be earning you enough to buy your own house. Not renting, not council, nothing like that. You buy your house, you buy a car. You are free. You invest in your own future. You are your freely choosing individual. You choose. And if it goes tits up, it's your fault. You should have seen it coming. You should have been a, a, an economic person and been constantly investing in your future and gone, hmm, I'll speculate on that. I'll diversify my, my portfolio. If you're not in a position to do that, if you work in a factory or a shop or down a mine or a, a university lecturer or whatever, it's your fault. You're a failure, loser. That's the, the, the psychology of it. And there's a lot of, um, if, you, if you, should you wish, um, read a lot of these kind of management self-help books, which I actually for a time did, not because I wanted any management self-help, but because I found them to be profoundly ideological texts. Uh, and there's something awful there. They were like, it's like going back to look at some kind of hideous accident. Like, it's like, oh, oh, what? And I'd read these books. They are all like this. Succeed. It's you. Only you. No one else. Don't think about anything else. Um... So yeah, so, this is one, the other reason, this is ultimately one of my favourite quotes from Zizek about this whole thing. This is where the ideology of going with the flow, not clinging. I was trained on this uh, operating platform. That's obsolete now, shit. Right, you're lost, you're gone, right? You need to, you need to actualise your inner potential and become a yoga teacher. Um, and become an online yoga teacher, right? <laughs> um, which is an interesting topic in itself. Actually, no, that is an interesting topic in itself. Somebody do an essay on that. Online yoga teaching. 
Yeah? We'll talk more about that. Um, Keller, okay. So, I've, you've been thrown around by market forces. It's stressed to high heaven, I know that. You've got essays, presentations, getting your degree, you've got money worries. What we need is a mindfulness break, so I want you to all, I'll turn the lights down. Um, okay. I want you to just relax and enjoy your mind. This is your break, by the way, so if you want to go to the toilet or anything. But please don't disturb the people doing the mindfulness exercises. Have some respect for the mindfulness. Okay, everyone? Posture, please. Okay. You ready? 